Good afternoon, everybody. Check my time. Welcome to the Valley Water Collaborative Community Outreach Meeting. Um, before we get started, I want to let anyone know that as a Spanish speaker, that we have the ability or we have a translation available. You'll see at the bottom of your screen the translation button. If I've got the right icons, Microsoft. Yeah, so we have Jesus make that announcement in Spanish. It will show up after I turn it on. Okay. So, yeah, go ahead, Jesus. Unmute, Jesus. Hola, si hay alguien que quisiera escuchar la presentación en español, uh, puede va a hallar una opción para traducir abajo en su pantalla después de que prendan esa función y ahí vamos a estar traduciendo la junta en español. And before you go in, Jesus, maybe you can let everybody know if they have questions, they can even either pass them to you and you put it in the chat or they can put it in chat themselves. Because once you go into that room, I don't believe in help the optimum specialist. I don't, we can't come over the, the speakers in the Spanish. Um, the participants can go back and forth. Just Jesus. Just Jesus can. can. Okay, so you, you can shout out a question and, and uh, we'd appreciate it. If you do have questions throughout the presentation, that you use the uh, reactions button and, and just raise your hand. And again, welcome everybody. We'll we'll get started now. We have a PowerPoint presentation to go through about the the activities that we're working on in Valley Water. And I think we've got a small enough group to go around the room to introduce the the folks that are both on Zoom and in here live in person. So uh, we'll go around the room first, starting with myself again, Perry Clausen, Executive Director. My name of Saul. Start the video, uh, but you can see me in the Farm Bureau room. My name is Maureen Thompson. I'm the Valley Water Collaborative Program Manager. I'm Eva Dwyer. I'm Assistant Program Manager for Valley Water Collaborative. I'm Ezra Clausen. I <clears throat> one of the outreach coordinators for uh, Valley Water Collaborative. So I am Ernie Garza. I'm the General Manager for East Community Services District. Mike Nini with Turlock Irrigation District. John Mauter with Modesto Irrigation. Larry Dawson with the Del Rio East Homeowners Association. Karen Morgan, City of Ceres on the board of the Valley Water Collaborative. And another peer staff, Monica. Hello there. Um, I'm an assistant program manager for Cures. And then Sorry, John. there's a. That's right, John. Yeah, I'm uh, John Mataka. I'm with Valley Improvement Projects. Paul. Paul Huckabuzz, Bronco Wine Company. Also serve on the Valley Water Collaborative Board. Laura. My name is Laura Placencia, and I am with Valley Improvement Projects. And then I'm Mr. McGuthrie. Or Guthrie. Martin Guthrie, Darling Ingredients. Thank you, Curtis. Curtis here, it's my Hillmar County Water District. And Barbara. Hi, Barb Dalgish with the technical team. Nice to meet you. Richard. Hello, Richard Meyer Hoff. I'm with the technical team as well. Yeah, we'll hear from Richard and, uh, and Barbara a little bit later. Then uh, Paul. Paul Sousa with Western United Dairies. Jenny. Hi, Jenny Fuller with the Central Valley Water Board. Aaliyah. Hello, Valeria Gasalum with California Rural Legal Assistance. And Herb. Hi, everybody. Herb Smart with Turlock Irrigation District. Jennifer. Hello, Jennifer. Hi, Perry. Jennifer Clary, Clean Water Action, filling in for Goto today. Uh, Nick. Hey, Nick Jensen here with California Rural Legal Assistance. Bianca. Good afternoon, Bianca with Valley Improvement Projects for Social and Environmental Justice. And then finally, Tony. Tony, you're on mute. Well, you have 
is. Oh, apologize. This is uh, Tony Tobar with the uh, Salida Sanitary District. Great. Thanks, Tony. And then we'll wait two seconds for Denise. <laughs> Hi, Denise. We're going around doing introductions. So you're going to ask, could you introduce yourself, please? And you're on you. No. Oh, there she is. Denise, uh, you're on mute. Can you introduce yourself, please? You bet. Good afternoon, everyone. Denise Molinax. Um, I'm with the California Dairy Research Foundation, um, but also a landholder in the Turlock area. Right, thanks. Welcome, Denise. Yeah, welcome everybody. Did I miss anybody that came in as we were doing introductions? Okay, and for those who uh, need Spanish translation, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see interpretation. Click on that button and you'll hear the presentation in Spanish. All right, we'll start out with our PowerPoint presentation. And uh, at any time during the presentation, please don't hesitate to ask questions. Uh, we will be posting both this recording and the PowerPoint on our website. So any of this information you'll have will be available after, after the meeting. All right, it may take us a, a day or two to get it posted, probably early next week. So this is our, our community outreach meeting that also invites our stakeholder committee to participate. So it's the two committees at one. Uh, we're having these periodic community outreach meetings and we're trying to do them about quarterly. We'll probably have another one again in February or in March. So we've gone around the room and done our introductions already. Uh, Jesus Nunez, I'll mention again, is an outreach coordinator as well. He's uh, working on the translation today, so I'm going to be doing his presentation. And then uh, you've heard about our consultants, GEI, Richard, and Barbara. Uh, Jackie, I don't think is on today. And then uh, Louis Arkans Calmanini, we have Barbara on the line. Vicki is the, the lead in, on that organization. This is a group that will be uh, performing, it has been performing the plan development that we need. And also will be completing the plan that we'll be talking about later today in the uh, in the meeting. So just real quickly, we're going to do uh, many of you, if not all of you, have been through these meetings before. So we're going to have a very brief introduction about Valley Water Collaborative, and I think one slide, uh, one slide uh, will show about the nitrate control program. There's many other presentations and meetings we've given before where you can go back on our website and review those to hear all the details about the nitrate control program. Richard will be covering a little bit of the key points of the past, but focusing mostly on the future activities. And then I'm going to start out with uh, dive right into the outreach and what are, what are the responses that we've been getting from our, our promotion so far. And then uh, Maureen and Eva, We'll talk about the application status and how many people are getting water, and then uh, also a little bit more on the safer program that we'll talk about. And then finally, Richard's going to be talking about uh, the work that started on the management zone implementation plan. That's the major deliverable that will be triggered once we get the approval from our preliminary management zone proposal. Uh, we expect that and uh, that approval to come early next year, and that will then trigger a a six month, I believe it's six month uh, timeline to get this uh, management zone implementation prepared. So I'm gonna dive right into it and first talk about uh, a function that we have added to our, um, oh, no, sorry, jumping too fast. All right, Valley Water Collaborative, very quickly. We're, uh, we're a nonprofit organization, a 501c3. We were formed specifically to implement the nitrogen, the nitrate control program in the Central Valley and specifically for the Modesto and Turlock Basin. Uh, we're based in, in this office we're in today, our administrative office at uh, the Farm Bureau office, and all of our staff are remote. Uh, we, st we started right in the middle of COVID, so it worked out okay that we had remote offices. We're continuing that way. We do have a, a place here in the office for people to come in in person to bring materials if they want to. Uh, you can see the mission down. Below, uh, 
Key to it is that we're providing it safe access to safe drinking water for residences whose wells are contaminated with nitrate. And now uh, with the expanded program that we'll talk about with other groundwater contaminants that are found in this region. And then we're also working on, you'll hear in this later plan, what we're expecting to do for, for protecting and enhancing the groundwater quality in this region. The groundwater, especially used for drinking water. So that's a real quick summary of what we do. The nitrate control program, then uh, the next slide. Or did I? Okay, we well, took that one out. So you'll have to go back to, go back <laughs> to the other one. So we, we just revised it. So we're, I'm going to give a summary of, of the applications that we have so far. Uh, as I started out to say, when, when somebody applies to the program, you can go to the next slide. Uh, when somebody applies to the program, there's a questionnaire that we use to ask them, how do they hear about the program? And those of us in the room, it, it's probably pretty hard to see, but I'll read the highlights. Our most common response so far has become has come from newspaper articles that have run on our program since the inception about 18 months ago. Uh, this in combination with other activities have, a, have contributed to the uh, over 900 applications we have today. Uh, Maureen and Eva are gonna go over those specific uh, statistics, but just to know we're almost at a thousand people have heard that about and, uh, and uh, responded and asked us for information about, about the program. So the newspaper articles are the key point, the key um, response that people have checked. And so with, to the next slide, uh, what we did is we, um, we prepared, I, I worked a lot with the editor uh, or the writer in the Modesto Bee and the Turlock Journal before we even started to let them know the program was about to launch. So it worked out well in that we were able to get them to uh, to come to respond to our press release. We got a, a, a rash of applications right after that happened. Also did a mailing at that time. We've also had some publicity or we bought a public service announcement at a Spanish speaking radio station here locally. And it uh, the commercial that we recorded uh, played seven times a day for a couple of weeks. We were also on their news program and their listener listenership is reported as about 69,000. Now, whether all those are our, our responses, I'm sure. Also, we were able to get uh, some coverage from ABC 10 and CBS 13 out of Sacramento, both of them because they read the articles in, in the paper. And the media events, and I use air quotes, air quotes around that is, is we, we did a, a press release at the initial launching of the program, got articles out of that. Then we also did a high school contest for uh, displays to use in our in our uh, program. And we were able to get some articles about that. I'll talk about that in a minute. And then uh, about earlier this year, we were able to get the SAFER grant, the $5.5 million grant, again, went back to the paper and they gave us some really good coverage about that. And then uh, more recently, we have a pilot project that I'll talk about later with the source water system that again was able to get us the publicity and actually captured the attention of the TV stations. And they again they talked about the source system, but also gave us a good plug for our water, for our water program and the well testing that we have. So we've been able to really get some good bumps, if you will, out of each of those new newspaper article timing and uh, that and combining with the postcards. So the next slide, uh, a little bit about that program or that contest that we ran. Um, we want to, we are continuing and we wanted to engage with the local schools, high schools and, and, and junior high schools. We started with high schools and the idea that we came up with is to have a display contest because we are, we've been at farmers markets. We started initially with posters and they weren't real attention grabbers. So we, we had this contest and had the high school classes uh, dis develop these displays. And we, uh, we talked with several of the schools and they uh, we asked about getting scholarships and they said, no, just give them cash awards. That'd be much more interesting. So we put up $3,500, us and uh, Ready Refresh, our bottled water provider, uh, so the school top three teams would get a cash award. The first place being $1,000, $1,500, 
thousand to five hundred. Uh, so we got we got um, uh, five schools to participate, and we got some really good displays. You can see some of them here that would have been very useful at our table and events, and uh, they're good draw for both adults and children. You see those little wells in the jugs, those seem to be a real attraction for kids under five years old, which their parents are in tow. So that gives Jesus and Nazar a chance to talk to them. So that, that program's worked out well. And again, the reason I, I show this is it was one of the things we got some, some publicity from for our program. And just on putting the parking lot for later conversations, we're looking for ideas for other events that we can take to the media and get their attention to our program, whether it's the main reason or a subsidiary reason to, to attract the press, if you will. Okay, so the next slide shows our next highest two uh, responses that we got were from postcards, which is the first bar, but the second is talking to neighbors, friends, or family members, and we tie those two together because we believe, and it, these, these surveys are inexact, but we believe a large reason for the second neighbors and friends was because people that got postcards and applied, they would tell their neighbors and friends. So the next slide, I'll show you the postcard that we've mailed. Uh, we, we had uh, mailing lists of about 4,000 residences that we identified, and I'll come back and show you how we did that. 4,000 residences we uh, uh, identified outside of public water systems in both the Modesto and Turwak Basin, and we did five of those mailings. Uh, four of the mailings were about to do a fourth mailing at the beginning of the year. We're going to do six. six. Oh, okay, it'll be six. That'll be the sixth. So we'll be doing a sixth mailing here um, after the <laughs> mail and exits all of our mailboxes and people hopefully look at their mail again. All right, so then uh, the other thing that we've been doing that has been getting us a, a fair amount of applicants, not as good as the newspaper, which is expected, but Jesus and Ezra have been going to a number of uh, events that use the term tabling, uh, where they, they get our displays, and you can see the photos there, those are the high school displays that we have at our, at the farmer's markets. We've been at the Turlock, Modesto, Oakdale Farmer's Market, went to a swap meet, Stanislaus County Fair, and so we, we, we're, we're at these events, Jesus and Ezra are keeping track of the number of people they talk to, so that's where the 1,800 conversations, 1,849 came from, and a total of 36 events the ones you see listed are the main events that you that you would recognize. Okay, the next slide. So the other way that people are hearing about our program is that Ezra and, and Jesus have been going to dozens and dozens of business in our management zone and bringing these flyers and putting these flyers in the windows on the counters. Uh, of these businesses, we often will either do as you see on the, the pictures, we'll put it in the wall or on the, on the window, or they'll leave a stack of the flyers uh, on the counter um, on, on the request of the, of the business owner. We've also posted these roadside stands, uh, signs that you see up in the upper right hand corner, there are two by three feet signs. And as many of you probably know, it's uh, it's illegal to post signs on rights of way or on telephone poles. So uh, we got permission from a number of property owners, both farmers, dairy men, and some of our board members to put these signs on their property. And we've got a number of people that have responded by saying they saw the uh, saw the signs out on the street, the phone number, and they called us. So it's. It's again one of many things that we're doing. We we plan to continue making sure the signs are still there and not defaced, and then also adding new areas uh, throughout our management zone basins. Okay, beginning of August, uh, Jesus and Ezra started canvassing, and the canvassing involves first uh, identification of the areas that we're going to focus on. And so the database that you'll hear about later from Mari and Eva has the ability through mapping to identify the disadvantaged communities uh, that are uh, placed on the map layers that we receive from state and other agencies. And we lay this into our database and then we pick out areas where we already have existing water recipients. So we, so we know there's nitrate in the groundwater and then, then our staff goes out and starts canvassing these areas. 
and each of the dots that you see on this map, they will go there. Somebody will be home. Somebody will not be home. They'll leave flyers, et cetera. But each of those, those interactions are recorded in the database so that we know generally how people are reacting. Uh, they'll go back and revisit the people that aren't there. So you can see the stats there. They were, they've had over 461 addresses visited and they were out yesterday. So that's as of yesterday. And again, the focus on the disadvantaged communities, they've had 184 conversations, 134 have been uh, expressed interest, 50 expressed no interest. And I don't think there's really been, at least what they've told me, there, there, that there's been many people that have been rude and, and not willing to even at least say no politely. I mean, some are a little testy, but but generally the people are quite nice, and, and the ones that are interested it usually take quite a few, quite a while to, to describe the program and what's going on. And I'll let Ezra expand on this a little bit. And, and of course, and hey, Susan, mm -hmm. kind of saying, I'll let Ezra expand, but this this is not an easy program to sell, if you will. Free is everybody has something free, and everybody's got to catch what they're free. This is a program that has no no strings attached, and it's very difficult to convince people to first to get their well sampled. There's some that once they hear that that data needs to go on GeoTracker, say no, thank you. That's a state database. Uh, others have other concerns why they they don't want to participate. And even though we explain to them that you're in an area that has high nitrates. We don't know about your well, but your neighbor's wells have high nitrate. All that is explained to them, but some people just, just don't want to participate for their own personal reasons. So there, there's a, quite a bit of effort put into that. Uh, so the next slide. So Ezra, I have to give you the next couple of slides and talk about what these visits are like. Um, yes. <clears throat> so I'm Ezra again. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, they, every day is different for us. We have just a myriad of responses from people, just different, tons of different circumstances. <clears throat> we, we do not know what each house is going to be like until we actually visit them. Um, just yesterday, we were, while well, we walked up to a property and we, this was, I can't remember what street it was off of, but the first house we visited it was completely the first house that was on this, this this land was completely abandoned. And but the second house, there were people there. And we were, but we weren't sure if they had heard us, if we had gotten their attention by knocking. <clears throat> but as soon as we were leaving, we, we left a couple of flyers there, but as soon as we were leaving, they came out of the house and we had a, a decent conversation with them about our program and how we run things. And they were very receptive and they took our information. So I guess, yeah, um, everybody's different and some people are more welcoming than others. It's much nicer when they are welcoming, of course, but you know, not everybody is, is that way. We've had a few people who don't even let us finish our little um, intro speech or a little intro to our, for ourselves and, our, and the organization. And so we just say, all right, um, that's fine. And we just, we, we leave, you know, if they don't want it, they don't want it. It's completely up to them. But we definitely do appreciate it when people are very nice. And even if they say no, but they're very nice about it, that we also, we really appreciate appreciate that as well. Courtesy goes a long way. So we go. Next slide. And these are just some photos of the different animals and little things we've seen. We got a safety man over there, just some mannequin some guy had in his yard that he just dressed up like a electrical line worker or something. I just thought it was funny. And of course, you know, the different animals. 99% of the animals we've met are <clears throat> either very friendly or just they just stay away from us. But um, we've had one or two, well, we had one incident and then we've had a couple other almost incidents, almost incidents. But, um, yep. That's yeah, so those groups, I know there's several on the on the Zoom link, uh, the Zoom that have experience in can canvassing, you, I think you identify with that, uh, understand that that scenario that everybody out there is different. You never know what to expect. 
And we unfortunately, in full disclosure, we did have one dog biting incident. Uh, unfortunately, one of our staff got bit. A minor bite drew a little bit of blood. It wasn't, you know, didn't didn't cause any infections or anything. We did all the appropriate reporting and such that we need based on what our insurance company said. But it's just going to be one of the hazards. It is one of the hazards of being out and about. And um, both Ezra and Jesus are very aware of that and, and taking the, the appropriate precautions and being trained on, you know, there's a million one training programs on the internet you can take for this. So we're going to make sure we, we cover them all. Not that they don't know this stuff, but we figure that that's the most safe, uh, appropriate thing to do. Okay, then we're on social media. Uh, social media is all the rage these days. You know, everybody's on, uh, got, got their Facebook, FaceTime, or whatever all these things are called. I'm an old guy, so I don't even know them all. But anyway, we really haven't gotten that many responses yet from that. If you look at our response list, it, it's dwarfed by all the other ones we've covered so far. But as with any of these medias, we've got to find the corner, the right corner of the social media world to put our programs so that we can we can focus on and attract our very distinct target audience, which is people with a well, domestic well, that are in, not on a public water system, obviously, and that have nitrate potential. So that that is a very targeted audience, and we, we're taking the approach of trying everything, and social media being one, will continue that despite the fact we're not getting a lot of responses, but we are uh, keeping it updated. Okay, next slide. Um, Jesus and I are on the road talking to the um, municipal advisory councils. I've been to over a half dozen of them. I'm on uh, on the agenda for the Chamber of Commerce in Modesto next month. And there's other chambers of commerce that we have talked to and we will continue. And anybody that has a venue that's listening to this, if you'd like our presentation, don't hesitate to contact us. We've got presentation that can be one or two minutes or a half an hour or and whatever whatever you want to have covered on our program we can uh, we can provide to the to the entity either in person or through uh, social media or zoom so the 23 outreach plan is to continue as we've been going uh we think we've done well with getting almost thousand applications and so we're going to focus again on on the things that are causing uh, that are developing the most the most applications. We're going to continue canvassing. Uh, that's a very slow process, as is the other media. And I say slow because you saw those numbers over 400 host houses. So far, we have five people that have indicated on the internet that they are on the application that they got the information from canvassing. So five out of 400 is a small response rate, but it, it's just part of our building a foundation in the communities that we're a legitimate organization. And I'm going to call Maureen real quick. We had a classic application recently that checked the other box and Maureen. I yeah, yeah, it was great. It was a, a great example of um, I think all of our outreach. They checked the other box on the application um, describing how they learned about us. And they wrote in, you know, it was a, a length of thing. They said they uh, saw a flyer, they got our postcard, they saw us in the newspaper, and um, they finally called, you know, when they think they saw a yard sign or something. You know, they just listed everything. And, and finally, and you know, finally after a year or so, they applied. So that was great. <laughs> but it meant that they've seen us around, and that's really great. Yeah, so I, I think that's a, that's very indicative of what it's going to take for people to finally uh, have, have either the willingness or the comfort with applying and, and, and actually going through the whole process. And we're trying to eliminate any of the barriers that we can. Okay, so is that, that a recent chat? I thought I saw a recent chat, but... Okay, that was just oh. construction. Oh, Martha mentioned the Catholic Radio for Environmental Justice. If we're interested, okay, good. Yeah, it's great. Awesome. Yes, another one from our uh, gentleman from Keith. That that will get you that name as well. Great. Ernie's in here wanting to learn about outreach. This is going to be for Keith's area, so we'll help him when we can. Okay. 
Okay, so the other uh, outreach activities currently <laughs> we're continuing the flyering and we, uh, we're tracking that on our MMS database as well, so that every place that we put a flyer, we record and we will know that we need to revisit them periodically. We're also <laughs> about to send out a letter to water recipients requesting them to pass the word on to their neighbors. Uh, and it, when some of them email uh, them a letter and then we include some flyers, we're also going to send some emails with a PDF attached with the flyer and just encouraging them to you know, talk about the program and get the word out for us. We're also planning to have another high school uh, display contest. We'll have the award ceremony in May again. Uh, last year, we used the 10 Pin Center over in Turlock, 10 Pin Fun Center, I think it's called. And it was a good venue and we had good participation in that. And then we, we've started some of this and we're continuing to build relationships with our community groups in the Modesto Turlock region. Uh, we want to collaborate on some event sponsoring and uh, and any presentation for local groups, committees, and organizations that are interested. We are more than happy to to uh, to participate in that or help wherever we can. So this is, I believe, a break in between subjects. I don't know if there's any questions uh, about what we talked about so far, clarification or otherwise. Okay, Marty and Eva, go ahead and the application update. Yeah, so um, to dive in with to our application uh, uh, update, um, we are targeting basically 4,300 wells um, in the region that we've identified as uh, potentially having nitrate in the groundwater. That's a, around a total population of 55,000. Um, individuals. Currently, we have a total of 883 applications received. Some of those applications are not eligible. That basically means they're not in the, they're sorry, they're not in the program boundary or they're part of a public water system. And um, then we are sending bottled water to 334 residences currently. Uh, we have 336 nitrate exceedances, uh, nitrate exceedance. And um, let me move into the next slide, actually. It explains a little bit more. We have 30, 330, actually, Eva, were you going to do this slide? Sure. Yeah, great. Uh, <laughs> so we have 336 samples that are above 10 milligrams per liter. So those are above the state, the state standard. They are therefore receive bottled water uh, or are eligible for bottled water. And then 149 below 10. And then 46 of those are between 7.5 and 10, which means we contact them in a year to have their well retested to see if it's changed. And then this is just a look at our database system. So on the left, those are all of the applicants in our program. Uh, in the upper right with the pink layer, that is our layer that is the disadvantaged community. So we're able to know where those are and target those for outreach. And then um, below, it's a little bit small, but that's just a sample of some of the information that each of those green pinpoints has. So this is the applicant form, and it actually goes way, way longer than this. And then also information on um, the well sampling test results, bottled water deliveries, et cetera. Just how we track everything. Yeah, and let me add into that, you can go back to that. This database, as I mentioned, both on our on our canvassing and any work we do, we are creating a library of information about locations and data and information and all the things that are going to be useful in what Richard's going to be talking about later. And that's the long-term implementation plan. So this is this is some this information that we're collecting is not available or has not been available until our program was in place. So it's going to help us a lot in targeting where our activities need to be, both in the immediate in the immediate term and the long term. Okay, I'm going to talk about a pilot program that our board of directors has approved for funding, and this is one of the. Uh, Articles that we were able to get in the Modesto B. So Source Source Inc. has a technology that simply said said takes uh, humidity out of the air, condenses it, and uh, pumps it into the house to a dispenser on the sink. 
and this water has is goes through a filtering process or it's not really even a filtering process the, the membrane that's used to extract the humidity does not take any pollutants with it it's it's a patent technology that's that i'm not a tech not a scientist but it essentially it, it's just extracting h2o out of the humidity condensing it using uh, using energy created from the solar panels. So what you see there is a combination of the solar panels and the collectors for the humidity. And there's three panels per home, and this is then installed in a home uh, uh, through plumbing that uh, that reaches into the, uh, those underneath the kitchen and up through the, the kitchen sink. So we have one installation in series. We have two additional systems that are just installed that are, um, that are operational. We have interest with another three. Uh, we're we're going to be uh, committing at least now as as uh, Valley Water of installing and paying for five systems, and we haven't worked out on a long term lease to uh, at a cost that's very comparable to um, um, under sink reverse osmosis systems. So so far so good. I've been keeping track and talking to the uh, the resident that lives in this house, and it's been supplying an adequate amount of water. Good quality water, and I guess the acid test with the husband said my coffee tastes better than ever using this water. So I guess that means it's uh, it meets the the taste test. And the shorter days have an impact in the water supply. The shorter days, the cooler days, has reduced the amount of capacity or the the amount of water generated. But according, and I've been following this, I heard you know we've been very wary of that. And she said on some days the water output is very slow but uh, it's adequate for their needs and they're, they're learning they said too they just you know, when it's flowing well they fill up a gallon jug and put it in the refrigerator and it ties them over for drinking and cooking so that that is some of the reason why we're calling it a pilot because we have concern I mean, we were very skeptical when we first heard about this system some beyond very skeptical and downright didn't want to I uh, thought this was ridiculous, but <laughs> so far it looks, it seems to be working well. There are, we aren't the first installations in the world. They've been using these systems in other states and actually for the military, from what we understand. But all that said, we want to know how it works in Stanislaw and Merced counties under our conditions. And you know, so far, so good. Uh, the company is is providing bottled water or is committed to providing bottled water if the systems are not producing adequate amounts. So far, they've not needed to do that. So anyway, we're we're going to continue looking for participants. Again, here's what the system looks like. Pretty straightforward. It's like having solar panels. They obviously need to be in full sun, uh, away from the house, and ground mounted. Okay, the other significant milestone in our organization was uh, about a year ago it's over a year ago we two years ago we started negotiating and, and talking with the state water board to apply with their safer grant program uh, we were given the okay to begin the program in january uh, 2022 uh, we started sampling for the additional contaminants in in may because it took a while to get our lab set up and and other things. And uh, so we, we've been sampling for the constituents you see on the screen, arsenic, which is 3T, chrome 6, and, and some other EDBs, uh, uranium. And uh, the program is set up to be a cost share arrangement. If there's nitrate in the well and the other contaminants, uh, there is a, a split for the pavement of the water. The sampling itself, the traveling out to the well and the analysis uh, are paid for uh, we have a cost share arrangement for that half half for going out to the well and then they pay for uh, the, the uh, contaminant analysis because it's much more expensive than nitrate and before I go any farther and that's not hard to give it back to more to even explain this further the cost share part yes yeah and um for the safer grant in order to qualify they have to be um, to get bottled water. They have to be in a disadvantaged community, and to get a uh, water treatment system, they need to qualify based on income. So, if, for example, a resident has nitrate and other contaminants, and um, they're not in a disadvantaged community, they would still get bottled water through our program, but we just wouldn't split that cost. 
there anything else you want me to expand on? Uh, and you can reiterate the, the cost share. I don't think I okay. that as well as you could. Too. So explain the cost share. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then um, it's a little for for bottled water. We're able to qualify them based on the map um, where their home is located. But if they did want a reverse osmosis system or carbon filtration for one, two, three TCP, then they just fill out an income certification form. And if they are low income, they qualify for a system plus a two year service contract. Yeah, if, if they don't fill out that income qualification. Yeah, if they don't fill out the form or if their income is too high, then they don't qualify for a water treatment system unless they also have to trade. Right. Quite complicated. But they do continue to get bottled water. If they're in a disadvantaged community only. Yeah. yeah. If they have nitrate, <laughs> though, for sure they get water regardless of income, regardless of where they're at. Yes. So it, it gets a little confusing. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. And the pro, as I mentioned, we launched January 2022. Um, we uh, got the final agreement signed in September, and the board needs to uh, be recognized at Board of Valley Water for agreeing to carry this project. We are still working on getting reimbursements from activities done in January. Uh, the invoice has been submitted. And any of you that have worked with the state water board knows that can be a time consuming process to get your check back. But we've been guaranteed it's going to be in the mail at some point soon. <laughs> so, anyway, we're, we're still charging ahead. And um, go ahead for continue on that uh, scenario. Uh, sure, yeah. So with regard to what we're seeing um, in the after their wells are tested, um, 179, so 50% of people, um, the N uh, colon other unknown basically means we haven't yet, we don't, we won't, they've only been tested for nitrate. So either they didn't move forward with other contaminant testing, um, or we just haven't received their test results yet. But um, about 50% are nitrate, and then 15% um, are nitrate only, 25% are have nitrate and other contaminants, and 9% have other contaminants only, so something else other than nitrate. Can you describe the 50% one again, please? Yeah, so N, um, so nitrate, or it's, it's just a status uh, name for us to identify which people have, either we haven't received their test results back yet, um, but we do know they have nitrate. We received the nitrate test results within 48 hours, so we know that information, but we are waiting for the re rest of their, their test results. Or um, most of those people are um, individuals that were tested for nitrate when we were only doing the nitrate control program, so when we weren't doing safer yet. Um, and so, but they did not want to do co-contaminant testing. Um, yeah, and those test results, those, the analytical work, one of them has to be sent off to another lab, but they, they are not a quick turnaround. They can be anywhere from 30 to more days before we hear back. Nitrates, as you mentioned, 48 hours and we get the result. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think that's, that's the end of that section on our application update. Are there any <clears throat> questions? I don't see any questions. Okay, Perry, should we move on? Yes. Okay. Hey, Richard Meyer of GEI is on the line. Richard, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Perry. I assume everybody can hear me just fine. Yes. All right, very good. Okay, so for the next few slides, we're just going to talk about what's next, starting with a little bit of uh travel down memory lane of where we've been for the last couple of years, but then focus on the, the hard work still ahead to develop an implementation plan for the act for the Modesto and Turlock management zones. So if you can go to the next slide, please. All right, so we created this little graphic here to kind of remind us this, this has been a long process. Uh, we're, we're, we're past year two, in fact, two and a half years into the overall program. Uh, started with a notice to comply back in 2020. That notice to comply went to the dischargers uh, so the growers, the dairies, the individual dischargers in both Modesto and Turlock uh, groundwater subbasins, and then through the work of the <clears throat> collaborative, 
uh, formed a management zone, which resulted first in the submittal of a required preliminary management zone proposal, which is a notice to the board that there's an intent to establish management zones in these two groundwater subbasins that was delivered as required by March 8th of 21. At the same time, uh, that, that plan included what was called the early action plan, which is what we've been talking about here for the last 45 minutes, which is the implementation of the drinking water program to provide water replacement water to those who have the need, have a well testing program, all those elements that have been talked about for the last 45 minutes, <clears throat> part of that early action plan. And that began implementation about a year and a half ago in May of 21. So fast forward to this year, and the latest deliverable was submitted to the regional board as required on time by August 29th, and that was the final management zone proposal. It is an enhancement of the original preliminary proposal, addressed comments from the uh, regional board on uh, the original submittal, uh, had additional information added, like knowledge gained is what I call it, uh, that we've learned from experience over the last uh, period of time, so that was incorporated, and so a final proposal for establishment of these management zones was given to the board in August. Since then, the board has been reviewing those. Uh, they put it about for public review, uh, so there was an opportunity for public comment during uh, the latter part of September and October, and comments were received, and the board is now considering those uh, at this time. And as Perry mentioned, right now it's expected that there will be some action uh, probably early part of, of 23, when the regional board will accept the final management zone proposal. And then that triggers the next deliverable due date, which is a management zone implementation plan. And that, that's the key document. So up to now has been you know, heavy preliminary planning, but the, the uh, program that uh, resolves nitrate issues in the management zones is what is characterized in this upcoming plan has to address three goals. Uh, first is provide long-term safe drinking water. The early action plan is providing early action to address those needs, but the, the final plan, the implementation plan, needs to address the long-term needs. Second is to reduce nitrate loading uh, from various sources and the, the, from the management zone participants so that they're no longer contributing uh, or causing exceedances of the nitrate water quality objective in groundwater. And then the last component is to have a plan to restore nitrate water quality in the groundwater where it already exceeds the 10 milligram per liter nitrate limit and do that where it's reasonable, feasible, and practicable. So the plan will address those three goals uh, when it's prepared. So next slide. <clears throat> so the next few minutes, I'm just gonna elaborate a little bit more for starting a little bit more about schedule and then talk a little bit more about content. So the regulation, the nitrate control program regulation, which is guiding what we're doing, uh, states that a management zone implementation plan, the MZIP, which is your new acronym for the day, uh, is due within six months of acceptance. So what will happen is the board is reviewing the final management zone proposals. They will issue a letter to the various management zones that are uh, accepted, and it'll have a due date in there for submittal of the MZIP. Current expectations, if they do this in the early part of 23, is that by late summer, we will be submitting this MZIP. There will be separate plans, one for Modesto and one for Turlock. This is to recognize that there are differences in the, in the two areas uh, with regards to which dischargers are located, in which areas and the like. They may have similar solutions going forward, but that's to be evaluated, but there, there could be key differences if, if appropriate. Once the MZIP is submitted, uh, the regional board does go through a, a pretty significant process to review those and uh, ho hopefully ultimately approve them. They first have to deem them complete, which means they obviously go back to the regulation, make sure what's required is captured by the, uh, the plans. They are have this, you know, adequate to meet the goals of the nitrate control program. There'll be various things that the board will look at when they review the plan. So there may be an iterative process where they ask for more information. On the other hand, they may look at them and say they're complete. Once the board deems them complete though, they will go through a full public process, a public notice, request for comment. There will be a hearing uh, before the regional board. 
to ultimately approve these plans, which will then set the, the, the final stage, which is the implementation of the plan itself, which we anticipate looking ahead early 24. Uh, so a little more than a year from now. Next slide. So that kind of sets the stage of what we'll be working on uh, as a technical team over the next year, working with the Valley Water Collaborative, the uh, participants in the management zone. We'll be having obviously meetings like this to share information along the way as we move forward with this plan. If you go to the regulation, there's a whole lot of bullets and there are the kinds of things that need to be included. Uh, this is my attempt to try and narrow it down to one slide to kind of hit the highlights of kind of a process of what we'll be doing. Uh, the initial part on the left there is, as with any plan, we have to make sure our data is up to date. Uh, we're working with the best information. And so that process, some of that's just started to begin right now, and we'll be getting a full steam uh, after the first of the year. But we're going to make sure our groundwater data is up to date. Uh, we have to do a nitrate loading analysis to understand sources of loading and uh, relative contributions to different areas by different sources. Make sure we fully understand drinking water compliance status. That information has been included in the uh, final management zone proposal, what we know at that time, but it changes, as you know, uh, from month to month. And so we, we are working with DDW or Division of Drinking Water to make sure that information is correct. Uh, work with the dischargers themselves because they are the, the participants and the uh, funders of the management zone and any other data that's needed to start formulating a plan. Then we all have two parallel processes going on at the same time. One focuses on the drinking water goals. And the first is, we, we, and to make really clear everybody here, we continue with, we call it the early action plan because that's what we're operating under now, but we need to develop what is called an emergency and interim needs plan within the MZIP. And it's effectively the early action plan moving forward. And so that while we're working on the long-term solutions, Everything we've talked about today, the the, <clears throat> cover, the uh, well testing, the replacement water, all those things continue as part of management zone implementation. So we have to capture all that and bring that into the plan. At the same time, though, remember the goal is long-term permanent solutions for drinking water. And so we, as part of the MZIP, will lay out a schedule with milestones on how that's going to happen over time and what those actions will be. In parallel, we'll be developing a nitrate reduction program to address the goals associated with that. The first is to uh, work with the dischargers on interim and final on the interim and final reduction goals. How we can how can we meet those in as timely manner as possible? It is sector discharger based. It's not this necessarily a global uh, plan in the sense that the entire management zone operates to achieve the goal at the same time, but we work with the individual dischargers that are participants as well as sectors such as dairy or growers, and how can we move those different entities forward with nitrate reduction, what's their schedule, what's their milestones and the like. So it's it's not global, it's, I mean, it's global in the sense of the entire management zone, but we work with the different entities to uh, ensure that they, as entities, meet the requirements of the uh, uh, nitrate control program. All this information then ultimately gets put together as a plan. Uh, so it'll include schedule and milestones. So that does <clears throat> key to make sure we're staying on target in terms of the implementation of the program once it's approved. Uh, it also includes a surveillance and monitoring program. That's an element that must be included to evaluate how are you doing over time as a ways to kind of check your success as you move along. So that that in one slide is a significant plan that has to be done in over the next year. So next slide. So I've probably talked about some of these things. So let's talk about one slide on the drinking water components since that's a key issue. Uh, I want to reiterate the interim emergency water component of the MZIP, which is the early action plan being pulled into the MZIP. That continues, and it will continue as long as necessary. At the same time, be working with uh, stakeholders on long-term drinking water solutions. Uh, this could be anything from the types of technology uh, that Perry was just talking about, the solar uh, where you have individual homes out uh, that are separated, but we could look at consolidation of uh, wells into a drinking water system. There's all kinds of different ways that will be looked at as finding ways to come up with long-term solutions. And again, we'll be looking at this within Modesto, with Turlock, and uh, of course, it'll have a strong community outreach component. Next slide. 
And Richard, I just want to emphasize that when you say Modesto and Turlock in, in our local area, people think those cities, but it's really it's Modesto and Turlock groundwater basins. Right. Correct. Th thank you for that. Yeah, this is the entire area covered by the basin. And then on the nitrate reduction component, this is kind of built off what's in the regulation. There's this concept of short versus long-term planning. Uh, so there may be some projects, programs, things that you can do early. Uh, the resources are there, the components are there versus those that may take longer to develop. Regardless, whatever the plans are to achieve the interim and final goals of the nitrate control program, these need to be laid out with a schedule and milestones on how they're gonna be implemented over time. It is tailored to individual dischargers or groups of dischargers. Uh, I mentioned that a minute ago. The plan would include who's going to do what when. That, think of it in that context. And there's also, as I said, triggers, ways to that have to be built in the plan to evaluate over time. Are you meeting the expectations of the plan? Check-ins along the way. To, and, if, and if you're not meeting the expectations of the plan, there are triggers built into the plan on next steps of how you will resolve those issues. Uh, so that's the nitrate program. Again, greatly simplifying a complex regulation, but that's the focus of the program. And I think that was my last slide, Perry. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Questions? And Richard, on any of the things we've covered, that was always quite a bit, but there's a lot of work ahead of us. We're just scratching the surface of it. Jennifer. Hi, great presentation. Hi, Richard. I'm Hi, wondering, Jennifer. I'm wondering how this is going to be coordinated with the irrigated lands program and the requirements of that because there's so much overlap. Yeah, I, I, I guess I would use a different term for overlap uh, or, or then overlap. So yeah, what Jennifer is referring to for some of you that are not involved in irrigated lands is two years ago and it may be even three years ago now the regional board added a requirement to any any farmer in the irrigated lands program that they had to sample any domestic well on their properties that were uh, enrolled in the irrigated lands program uh, now the water coalitions didn't work on this it was a direct uh, communication between the water board and the growers themselves and so what happened is there were a number of well, the results have to be posted on GeoTracker and then the water board is notified through that those results if somebody has an exceedance. And the responsibility of providing them model water landed on lands on the, the landowner themselves. We do have some applicants. Smaller growers or others that have part that are participating in our program, and and we don't say no to anyone. So we get the results that were from their well test that were performed for the irrigated lands program. And so if those uh, those individuals are needing uh, don't have the resources for bottled water or other reasons, then we provide them with with that uh, with that service. And as far as what. What's going to happen in the future? We're going to be meeting with with, um, with the Regional Water Board in January. Apparently, there's some other activities that are thinking about the management zones being involved with with the irrigated lands programs, but we, we haven't heard the specifics of that yet. So, Jennifer, I, I don't know if that's what you had in mind or. Yeah, I know that's top of mind right now. I'm, I was more thinking about Richard's presentation and how implementation of the of the management zone implementation plan is very similar to implementation of the irrigated lands program. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not the exact same discharges, right. of course. Yeah. A lot I'll of start, and then Richard, you can elaborate. But essentially, the the nitrate, the irrigated irrigation and nitrogen management plans that growers fill out now, and then the groundwater protection formula values and targets process is what irrigated agriculture is going to be submitting to Richard as the activities that agriculture is going to do for source control. And, and that's way short of what that is in totality, but Richard, if you could elaborate on that and other yeah, I, as well. Right, I think you're saying exactly what I was going to say is that we're, we're trying not to create something new 
we're trying to work with what's already being developed. And so we'll start with that as our baseline and then take a look at that in the context of nitrate in the entire management zone. So growers obviously are a significant component, but we need to look at it in the context of other dischargers as well. So I think I think Perry's uh, summarized it best, but we start with what is already planned for implementation right now. Yeah, dairy, I, I don't know, that Richard, you, dairy is in a similar situation, right? Yes, that's correct. They're they're currently working on, I think in their new order, we have yet to, to meet with dairy. We're getting ready to start all this in January, but we haven't met with them yet, but they're working on their program as well. So again, whatever's being evaluated from their standpoint, we would incorporate again, but it'll have to be looked at in the context of what we need to do in the management zone for the outcome, but uh, we know those discussions are already going on within their order right now. Yeah, and the, the the poultry general order is the only other one that's similar where it's a group of dischargers, whereas everyone else, cities, um, with, um, individual dischargers from, oh, what would it be, wineries and others, they have their own individual permits. Right. They then are developing programs for reducing nitrates that right. the puzzle pieces that fit into our overarching plan. So Jennifer, for example, and uh, and you may be aware that uh, our you know we work with Lou Scalmanini as partners on for Valley Water Collaborative, but we're also working in other management zones. But within the Kings, we recently uh, did some outreach with their dischargers, uh, the individual dischargers, to start asking for their data as to you know, how how are they uh, it's just confirming, first of all, their operation, but what is the quality of their effluent discharge? Where does it go? What's the volume? Those sort of types of information, which then allows us to start looking at them as individual dischargers versus, say, collective discharges like growers. So it's a bunch of puzzle pieces that have to be pulled together. Thank you. <clears throat> I think we have a question in the chat. Yeah. So, Perry, we have another question up here. You can see on the screen. So, this is John from uh, Valley Improvement Projects. What neighborhoods are included in this project as disadvantaged communities? Well, without naming specific neighborhoods, so you can imagine that map that you saw. In that, in that database that we have, we will put in the layers for the public water systems. So that would be, let us know, series, Turlock, Houston, all of, the, all of the communities, cities, and otherwise that we know have public water systems. They have clean water. They can deliver anything but clean water, safe water. So we take those, in a sense, we take those off the maps and then we start around the perimeters. Right now we're working the perimeter of Turlock for the canvassing, but our mailings themselves, we take everybody's rural address outside of those city water systems and we're doing mailings to them. They're our targeted outreach. They've gotten four from us. We're fine tuning that list. So we're, 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 doing, we're doing more mailings to those areas. So I, that's kind of generally how we do it. Naming the individual neighborhoods. I, if you if you really want to know more in detail, let us know, and we'll we'll go over those and read those to you. And Safer but, has their own definition as well. Yeah, the disadvantaged community, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and that's what we're following for um, for this income verification and, and the free bottle water for the other contaminants. Again, nitrate. Yeah, nitrate. You got you're in the program, no charge ever, initially or ever. So, uh, John, I guess that was, I, is that get, get at your question? All right, I think. Uh, I think he's muted. John, I think you might be muted. I see you maybe talking. <laughs> okay, yes, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, yeah kind of, uh, kind of. I understand that if it's within a city or a county, um uh jurisdiction it's off the board that's up to the city and the county water no people. just the city oh just the, the city county, yeah the county is that, that encompasses in the groundwater basins we're essentially covering all of Stanislaus county 
east of the San Joaquin River and then Merced County just north of the Merced River. So it's only the cities or small communities or even smaller systems than that that, that are called state smalls and, and other various labels. They, they are required already, have been for years, to, to provide safe waters. They can't operate unless they have uh, the ability to test and show that they're pre, uh, providing clean water. So we're, okay. we're everybody else. Okay, everybody well, else. okay, well, let me let me use an example here. This is the reason why I'm asking that. I live I live in Grayson. We're not in this study because we're the West Side, and I understand that. But for years, uh, we were on wells, private wells, and. Um, uh, you know, uh, they, it was outrageous in nitrates and, uh, and the, the people, even though they were run by um, Del Este Water, which was a company, uh, uh, they were way out of compliance. So I guess I'm having a little trouble. I understand what you're saying. You're saying that if they're running a water district and basically they're charging people for money, I mean, money for water, uh, I, I guess is the best way of saying it. Yeah. Then they're then they're obligated by law to provide clean, uh, uh, drinkable water. Yes, yeah. that's correct. And Grayson, Grayson yeah. is in the Delta Mendota Basin, groundwater basin. They're on the other side of the river. They are what's called a priority two basin. They will be forming a management zone in approximately twelve months. And there's conversations now about them joining Valley Water Collaborative and becoming part of our effort. That's very early on conversations, but they will either form their own management zone administration to comply with the regulation and go through the very same thing we're doing, or they're gonna be joining Valley Water and then still go through the same steps that we are doing here, have been doing the last two, two years that Richard talked about. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I'm not really speaking for Grayson right now, although I know we're coming up, but I, I'm thinking about like in Modesto, for instance, there's a place called Riverdale Track. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, state small. Yes, yeah, it's a state small water system. Yeah, yeah. We're, we have that identified in our early plan as, and, and we're tracking that, that uh, water system. Okay, so would that one, uh, how would I say, would that one uh, be serviced or no? Richard, you can help me on this one, but I believe we will be working on that system for long-term solutions, possibly. I say, say but, possibly, and John, one of the things that's happened in the, I think it was about a month ago, we met with DDW staff to make sure that our information, their information is the same. Uh -huh. And so that process is going on right now. So that the very thing you're calling out, we don't miss somebody. And mm -hmm. so I'd have to go pull up the final manager's own proposal, see what, what we stated about Riverdale. It sounds familiar. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure it's in there of what our status was when we last submitted, which would be August. But if there's any question of whether or not they are in compliance, we would certainly reach out to them to see what, if there's ways that this program versus what they may already be required to do. Uh, so there's not a gap. That that's the problem. Sometimes there's gaps where things just don't get addressed, and we want to we want to close those gaps. Yeah. Well, well, I, I'd appreciate it if you check into that because my understanding, <clears throat> some of those folks, um, a very small percentage of them, are getting drinking water, uh, like twelve, you know, twelve people out of a community of I don't know a couple hundred. So sure. that's the reason why I'm bringing it up. So if you can yeah. check, no yeah. Item. We will do that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's another question from Bianca. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the, the answer to that is yes. Uh, that, that was a data source that was used in the final management zone proposal for defining disadvantaged communities. And so there, there's a list in that document. And again, I think the document's posted to the website, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct, Maureen? Yes, that's correct. Yes, okay. And just a reminder, the disadvantaged community um, uh, requirement for bottled water delivery is only for safer. It is not for nitrate only. 
for right. anyone who has any nitrate or anyone who has <laughs> any nitrate yeah yeah right we don't say no to anybody yeah we no questions asked on nitrate testing or bottled water when they're in exceeds if they're above 10 they get water for free right regardless right All right, anybody else? Questions? Oh, and everybody gets their well tested. Just to clarify, <laughs> everyone, no matter, there's no income, any, you know, no, no income certification <clears throat> or disadvantaged community requirement for well testing. Okay. Yeah, we're going to do supply. All we do is yeah. Right. And be in the basin. And be in the basin and not in a, yeah. in a public water system. <laughs> Does and apply from over the north in the Lodi area or Griffin and all around. Um, I think we've even had some from Grayson apply, but uh, we're we're limited right now. Not limited; it's a huge area. But we're just covering it as going through a lot. We're relatively limited, right? Well, I think that's it. Uh, anytime anybody's got any ideas. For outreach, uh, Leo, we're going to be working with you. Have a conversation about a possible resource fair and, and other things. And um, yeah, any ideas, promotion, and otherwise to get the word out, we'd appreciate any help that can be offered and ideas. So, I think anybody else around the room, questions or thoughts? Okay. Very good work. And again, we'll be posting this on the on our website here, probably early next week, uh, this recording of this and uh, the PowerPoint as well. Oh, by the way, those of you that are in Sac Sacramento centric, or I guess you don't have to be anymore, the Regional Water Board tomorrow, uh, Thursday, let me speak right, Friday morning at nine o'clock, the Regional Board is, is having an item on the management zone program throughout the Central Valley. There's going to be an update provided by two representatives of the management zones. I, will, uh, I won't be part of that, but I'll put in my uh, public speaker card and, and speak for a couple of minutes. So any of those want to zoom in on that, it's uh, you go to the State Water Resource Control Board, jump over to the Regional Board, Region 5, and it'll, it'll take you to the board meetings, agendas, and there's, uh, there's a link there to go to the actual live Zoom uh, streaming of that meeting. And it too will be recorded. We'll be reposting that recording of that uh, presentation on the Valley Water uh, website within a few weeks. I, I I did receive a message from Martha. Um, you you said you'd like to say something. Yes, I just wanted to let um, you know that on the 11th, which is a Sunday, I don't know if you have anyone available, but it's Human Rights Day, and I am doing a presentation actually on water and some of the um, disparities that we're dealing with in Merced. Um, so if someone would like to reach out to me, I'd love to have them come in and maybe even table and uh, give a few minutes on what um, is being provided for the community in Merced County. So uh, um, I'll leave my information. Yeah, Martha, we have some coverage in Merced County, the, the slice of the county that's north of the river, but the city proper and the, the communities in that immediate area are in a priority two basin. And I'll be, I would say the same thing that I mentioned to John about Grayson, Merced uh, basin uh, stakeholders are, con are considering participating in Valley Water. Uh, and it looks like it's it's almost a sure thing. So their their program rolls out in about a year. But um, get in touch, send us an email. We'll see about it. And there'll have to be a lot of caveats and people from Merced come to us and we can tell them it's going to be a year or so. But uh, I think that sounds like a good opportunity. We'll see, check everybody's schedule to see about participating in that. Yeah, I, I just think it'd be a good conversation just to piggyback with the discussion of water. Um, you know, when you mentioned the nitrates and the phosphates, I I, I really, um, I'm trying to bring a little bit more narrative and understanding about the uranium that's in our water. Um, and I know that a lot of people are like uranium, but, um, you know, we know that we were all, um, our water comes from a mining community, you know, and as climate changes, a lot of those mineral deposits are now finally filtering down to our our um, watersheds. And that that is, you know, one of the things that, you know, we, we kind of need to bring to attention. And I know that specifically 
you know, you're looking at certain uh, chemical compounds, but there are so many others that are significant and also uh, very, very uh, um, influential in the health of um, our community, both in Stanislaus and in uh, Merced County. So um, I'm hoping that that will eventually open up to other um, compounds. Yeah, we are with the SABER grant, <clears throat> we are uh, analyzing our water samples for uranium and of the other contaminants beyond nitrate, which are arsenic, 123T, chrome 6, and uranium. Uranium is the highest detection or exceedance that we are finding. And it's, um, it, as you probably know, it's likely or possible up in that area, down in that area as well. You know, our, our soil profile that's under our feet here in the valley is a result of the erosion of the Sierra Nevadas, and it's a natural occurring element, notwithstanding mining, but you know it's an element that's probably accumulated in our aquifers and in our, our soils for millions of years. So we're, because we're using that water in some areas, uh, we're finding that uranium. But yeah, that's, uh, it's certainly a concern on the state level, state water board and the drinking water system uh, entities are very aware of that, the public water system entities. But thanks, Martha. Send, uh, drop us an email if you would. Okay, if no one else has any questions, again, thank you for participating and joining us today and uh, watch your emails and uh, so pass it on to others, uh, the website, and they can sign up for our uh, announcements when we have future meetings and other activities that you all need to know about. So again, thanks a lot.